Okay, great. So, hi everyone. My name is Anna Angelic, and uh, I'm a former CMO, Master Gabrielle, and a former Chief Brand Officer of Rebecca Minkoff. And before that, I worked in fashion sustainability and in agencies with the biggest world's luxury companies like LVMH and Sotheby's, Richemont, and so on. So, my area of specialization is intersection between sociology. I have a PhD in sociology from Columbia and technology and luxury and what kind of formats emerge when uh, technological innovation in terms of sustainability, in terms of interactive materials, in, in terms of interactive technologies come in an industry like luxury fashion or luxury lifestyle or hospitality or the hard luxury business. And here I'm going to talk to you about um, how brands in the luxury fashion market and in the fashion market overall can modernize their brand strategies. My uh, focus right now is to work as an advisor with startups and also with established companies on building brand driven businesses and I'll, I'll unpack that during my presentation. So I'm trying to click here but it's not going forward my clicker. Okay, it's going now. So the springboard for this presentation is the statement of science fiction writer Frederick Paul, who said, oh, it's easy to invent an automobile, but it's really hard to predict the traffic jam. And I think that 2020 was a year when, 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 when this statement rang more true than, than, than usual, meaning that we were absolutely unprepared as, as executives, as leaders of companies for the shape and the format of the market after COVID and during COVID-19. We were completely unprepared for a global health crisis and we didn't have any strategic scenarios to deal with the global pandemics. Pandemic. So this year is actually a great reset point and not just the reset, but also rethink point for fashion brands to see how can we take into account externalities of our actions and what are the social, cultural, environmental side effects of everything that we do because as 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 all of you know on a sea level of brand leadership in luxury companies it's mostly about what is the balance sheet, what is the Excel, what are our sales, product sales, what is the traffic for put, footprint, what, is our, uh, what are our e-commerce sales. We never really think, stop and think until recently at least, what is the sustainability impact, what are the side effects in terms of environment, what are the, what are the side effects in terms of our corporate responsibility to the, our workers and what are the side effects in terms of culture, what kind of behaviors do we encourage? And I'm really glad that now those questions, those externalities, the traffic jam is at the focus of, uh, of what, what we are talking about and what we are thinking about and of our future brand building models. So the springboard for this presentation, which is going to be in two parts, one is the macro market level and the second is how to apply those different shifts that are happening on the market level on the specific brand strategy and execution in the second part springboard is that we are now in on-demand markets and what does that mean supply driven markets are those that are organized around companies and their value chains 
production, supply, production, distribution, marketing and sales, and so on. So everything that fashion companies did was to increase the value of the product throughout that process. In on-demand markets, consumer is in charge. And that means that when faced with abundance of choice, and that is the situation where consumer operates today is abundance of choice, the most important thing what the brand can do is offer service, build personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with its customers. And case in point is that Neta Porte and Matches Fashion and My Teresa these days they made eighty percent of the revenue, or as high as forty percent during pandemic, on selling to extremely important persons, which is more than VIP, thanks to that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship that their stylists have, dedicated stylists have. Those are the people whose average order value is so high that keeps the companies afloat. As a model, this means that in demand-driven markets, we need to help our customers choose between different options. And of course, they're going to choose what is uh, what the companies that have the highest uh, degree of relationship with because when you're faced with too much choice we usually opt out not to do anything according to psycho psychology research so one of the five macro trends that i uh, that i detected basically sorry my clicker is acting up is that i detected in demand driven markets is the first one is retail everywhere retail everywhere oh my god my phone is like acting out just ignore it listen to what i'm saying oh okay so yeah uh, demand uh, de oh, oh sorry Yeah, so uh, click to purchase or is uh, retail everywhere. And we've seen that before the, this holiday season, Instagram put its social commerce on steroids. They're not only shopping stores, which is a new thing, which creates a direct relationship between the brand and the consumer and completely bypasses the middlemen that department stores or aggregators played in the past. They also have a gift guides. And over this weekend, which is in, in New York, in, in the United States, Thanksgiving, a lot of influencers created those gift guides. So for me, one thing that we dealt until last year it was omnichannel how to connect the physical presence wholesale and e-commerce now that sounds completely obsolete now that that seems like something from a completely different era because what we're dealing right now we are dealing with such a granular micro channels of consumer interaction that goes from instagram commerce to secondary marketplaces like depop to explosion in e-commerce and closure of physical stores so that forces us to really dial up on our thinking about customer journey and also about our thinking about the data and the service we provide at each step of the process. I'm going to try to rein in this um, clicker a little bit more. So yeah, uh, next step is for me the data-driven uh, retail, which goes exactly back to what I said in an explosion of e-commerce. At least in the United States during the pandemic, the commerce jumped, I think, more than 25%. That means that retailers have unbelievable amount of data, an unbelievable amount of data where the customers are, what is the demographic of those customers, what are they buying, and so on. That means like you packed basically a year or two years of data in one very concentrated period. The amount of data that retailers have was, however, never the challenge. The challenge was the disconnect between the volume of data and what re fashion retailers, retailers do with that data and how they use it in, um, in their physical retail, in their communication, and, and, and so on. 
The third thing uh, that is happening is what we're seeing with a lot of Amazon stores. Granted, that's not fashion despite uh, Amazon's luxury efforts, which by the way, I think are going to be successful. It is minimizing the contact between people in a store. And that is something that in a post pandemic, even after vaccine is going to be uh, a decision making fa factor for customers. Once the store is reopened, once the volume of food traffic increases, the question is going to become at which point you can use Amazon Alexa or at which point you can use the voice interface to get information you need rather than, than, than interacting with the human. And for luxury fashion, usually just contactless checkout is not an option because of the personalized service but a lot of other things can be like finding different sizes and so on so contactless retail is something that we are probably going to want to double down on when thinking about our brand and business strategies the next thing is that what i've seen in the past few years is that there is no such thing as a mass market. And especially, this is especially true in mature markets. And a lot of fashion markets are mature markets. There is no one size fits all mass brand and so on. There is no one door into the brand. Just like my Netflix is not the same as your Netflix. That means my Gucci is not the same as your Gucci, for example, or Louis Vuitton or, or, or even Four Seasons. That means that brands need to adopt more personalization approaches and think of themselves as portfolios, as houses of brands, even if they think of their collections as their sub brands. They don't need to evolve a complete uh, new sub brands, but they should think about how their collections, how their products can be grouped together for a specific niche group of people. And that is where data that I talked about before came, came in. The next one and the last one of the macro trends is the last mile, which is becoming more and more and more important. When going back to data, we've seen that a lot, like Amazon has proven that the data about local purchasing habits and local product consumption can shorten the period of delivery because the brand stocks different products in different collections in different neighborhoods depending on the need. So nano warehousing is becoming a big trend. It means you don't need to wait two days. You can get something thanks to the last mile delivery within an hour if that is stocked at the time. Klarna is currently experimenting with the modular mailbox, which basically is not only a mailbox, but a recycling center, pick and drop off things and so on. The last mile has been unbelievably compressed. It's getting closer and closer to, to our home. So based on these five big trends, which is data-driven, uh, local retail, initiation of everything, contactless retail, last mile, and, uh, and retail everywhere, how do we sort of filter all of that and apply specifically to our brands and business strategies? First step in this process is to really reconsider how we market our brands. A successful brand like Goop, for example, or Tracksmith, which is a luxury running brand here in the United States, they have fans before they have customers, which means there are more people who know about the brand than people who are actively purchasing the brand. So now why is that important? In traditional fashion media buys, anything that went before beyond the very specifically defined targets was considered a waste of money. That's not necessarily the case when it comes to fashion brands because there is a high aspirational value there. People don't wear Rolex to show that they have money. They wear Rolex or Tracksmith or, or, or buy from Goop so that other people know what it means to buy from those places. It's all, it's a status symbol and it's signaling. So they're doing the word of mouth. They're doing the advertising for your brand. And in that sense, you want to have as many people like that as possible who are aware of the brand. So once they can afford it, they're going to go and, um, and, and, and convert them. 
The next one is that usually, at least in my experience in fashion, the brand symbolic side and the business side were completely separate, the functional side. So the brand was something that was in the domain of PR or communication, but it was not something that was part of the balance sheet. It's absolutely critical that the brand becomes part of the balance sheet because brand defines and guides, shepherds all strategic decisions, which means should we grow through sub brands? Should we open a new brand? What, do, what does it give to? A sub brand? What does it take away from? What is a two year plan when we look at basically what we want to promote as our brand? It all goes through very specific actions. And in that sense, the messaging, the communication, the brand experiences and actions need to be part of the overall calculation of how you make money. The next one is, and my clicker is crazy, is to grow through the niches. I mentioned that in mature markets, there's so many sub taste groups that a brand can lose identity if, that, if it tries to serve all of them. The solution is to create a much small target groups of customers and deliver specific benefits to those customers. Again, Netflix is an example. The Netflix brand is not its content, it's personalization. And the way they achieve that level of high personalization is that they tag their content with more than 2000 different tags. Film noir, that's also romance, that's also Japanese, that also is anime and whatnot. And they pair it with the customers that are not described based on demographic information, but they're described based on their psychographics, their values, their interests, their beliefs. And then those two pairs of data are matched and that is where the personalization happens. So successful brands are those that can think of themselves not as one door in the brand. And you're seeing a lot of mass brands here in the United States um, filing for brand bankruptcy because they think of themselves as one big brand, one value system, one single taste. There is no one single value system. There is no one single taste anymore. And a brand needs to build and think of itself as a portfolio that caters to all those different tastes. And I completely, aha, uh -huh, okay, I lost. So, so now that is basically what I just described, how you think like, about your brand, not as a mono brand, but as a multi brand. Yes, you can have one umbrella value promise, you can have one umbrella vision, but how is that delivered needs to be personalized on the level of packaging, on the level of messaging, on the level of newsletters, on the level of personal interaction and customer service. So the last one here, can I have my present? Uh -huh. Is that is uh, to go back to what I was saying before, is to really build a data-centric organization. And this is easier said than done, because even brands, in my own experience, that have a very strong data teams, usually the data remains trapped in different teams. Media companies, uh, media comp fashion companies are very siloed still. So the data just lives very, like footprint data lives with the physical retail. Wholesale data lives with the wholesalers. E-commerce data lives with e-commerce team. There is no integration between different um, parts of the company. And the big challenge here is also that we may be measuring obsolete things like food traffic is something that comes from a deep, from a past era when physical retail dominated the fashion market environment. More important than that is brand memorability that goes back to what I was saying about making the brand part of the balance sheet is the engagement, is the recall, is the overall sentiment. It means that like we need to put in social media data into the overall calculation. So to wrap up here, uh, physicists David Deutsch said that we're always going to have problems and that the solutions we come up with to solve those problems are going to create new problems. So again, we're, we're going to continue dealing with traffic jams, which is a pretty, pretty solid prediction. I can put money on that one. 
so the biggest challenge here when we are designing our, our business and brand strategies which should be integrated is to focus on what is really important and that is something that our pandemic forced us. It forced, forced us to focus on what's important, which is kindness, which is fairness, which is trust, which is collaboration, which is operating on a distributed manner, which is diversity and respect. And these are all valuable goals, both business as a brand and as leaders, we should focus on that. Thank you very much.